Hi, welcome to Harvard Applied Math 205, a graduate course in scientific computing and numerical methods. I'm Chris Rycroft, and in this final video of the course, we're going to look at the conjugate gradient method, a very famous algorithm in scientific computing. The conjugate gradient method has some interesting mathematical structure and is a very efficient way to solve a broad class of sparse linear systems. We now turn to another Krylov subspace method, the conjugate gradient method, or CG, that was introduced by Hestines and Stifel in 1952. And CG is an iterative method for solving linear systems AX equal B in the case when A is a symmetric positive definite matrix that we often abbreviate as SPD. CG is the original and perhaps most famous Krylov subspace method and it is a mainstay of scientific computing. We briefly discussed CG in Unit 4, and the approach in Unit 4 was called nonlinear conjugate gradients. And this is an algorithm that applies the approach of Hestines and Stifel to nonlinear unconstrained optimization. And at the time, we just presented that algorithm, and we did not talk about where it came from. And so here we're going to look in detail at how exactly these algorithms work. So iterative solvers like CG and direct solvers like Gaussian elimination for solving linear systems AX equal B are fundamentally different. With direct solvers, if we work in exact arithmetic, then we should get an exact answer after finitely many steps. With iterative solvers, in principle, they require infinitely many iterations, but they should give an accurate approximation after a few iterations. Direct methods are very successful, but iterative methods are typically more efficient for very large sparse systems. And Krylov methods typically only require matrix vector multiplications or vector vector operations like dot products, and therefore, if Krylov methods are working on a large, sparse, n-by-n n matrix, they will typically require big O of n operations per iteration. And they don't suffer from some of the problems that direct methods have. For example, fill-in of sparse matrices that can happen in the LU factorization. In addition, iterative methods are generally better suited to parallelization and therefore they're an important topic in supercomputing. So let's now look at the CG algorithm. And it's certainly not obvious how this algorithm works up front, but we'll first get an overview of it before we look at how it works in detail. And the algorithm makes use of three sets of vectors. We have the vectors xk that are our solution iterates. We have corresponding residuals rk, and they are defined such that every stage rk is equal to b minus a of xk. And then we have directions that we update our solutions by pk. And in the algorithm, we first compute a scalar alpha k. We then use that to update our solution xk, and we update the corresponding residual rk. We then compute a second scalar, beta k, and we use that to find the next direction, pk, that we will move in on the next iteration. So let's now look in detail at exactly how this algorithm works. And to begin with, we're going to define x star equal to a inverse b as the exact solution to our linear system. And we can therefore write down that ek is the error at each step, which is equal to x star minus xk. We'll also introduce an a norm defined for a vector x to be the square root of x transpose ax. So we now have a theorem that says that the CG iterate xk is the unique member of the Krylov subspace kk of ab that minimizes ek with respect to the a norm. In addition, we have that xk is equal to x star 
for some k less than or equal to n. And the proof of this result relies on a set of identities that can be derived by induction from the CG algorithm. The first identity is that kk of AB is equal to the span of the vectors x1 to xk. That's also equal to the span of the vectors p0 to pk minus 1. And it's also equal to the span of the vectors r0 to rk minus 1. The second identity is that rk transpose rj is equal to 0 for j less than k. And the last identity is that pk transpose a pj is equal to 0 for j less than k. From the first identity above, it follows that xk is in the Krylov subspace kk of ab. And we'll now show that xk is the unique minimizer of ek with respect to the a norm in kk ab. To do this, let x tilde be another member of kk ab that is a possible candidate minimizer. And let's define delta x to be equal to xk minus x tilde, the difference between the two points. So, if we look now at the a norm squared of x star minus x tilde, then that can be written as the a norm squared of x star minus xk plus xk minus x tilde. And that can be written as the a norm squared of ek plus delta x. And by definition, we can write this as ek plus delta x transpose a ek plus delta x and we can expand this out as ek transpose a ek plus 2 ek transpose a delta x plus delta x transpose a delta x. Next, let r of xk be equal to b minus a of xk, which is the residual at step k. And we have that r of xk is equal to b minus a xk, which is equal to b minus a xk minus 1 plus alpha k pk minus 1. And that is equal to r of xk minus 1 minus alpha k a pk minus 1. We see in the initial setup of the CG algorithm that r of x0 is equal to b, which is equal to r0. And we also see by induction that in line 5 of the CG algorithm, rk is equal to rk minus 1 minus alpha k a pk minus 1. Therefore confirming that rk is equal to r of xk for all k equal 1, 2, 3 and so on. So now recall our expression for the a norm squared of x star minus x tilde. So that was equal to ek transpose a ek plus 2 ek transpose a delta x plus delta x transpose a delta x. And we can note that 2 ek transpose a delta x can be written as 2 delta x transpose a x star minus xk. And that can be written as 2 delta x transpose b minus a xk. And that is equal to 2 delta x transpose rk. So we know that delta x, which is equal to xk minus x tilde, is in the Krylov subspace kkab. And from our identities, we have that kkab is equal to the span of the vectors r0 to rk minus 1. And we also know that, from our identities, that rk is perpendicular to the span of r0 to rk minus 1. And therefore, we know that 2 ek transpose a delta x has to be equal to 0 because of that orthogonality relation. This implies that the a norm squared of x star minus x tilde is equal to ek transpose a ek plus delta x transpose a delta x. And the first term here, that is just the a norm squared of ek. So we can therefore see that this whole expression has to be greater than or equal to the a norm squared of ek. And we will only achieve equality in the case when delta x equals to zero. So this therefore tells us then that xk 
is the unique minimizer within the Krylov subspace KK of AB that minimizes this quantity EK with respect to the A norm. This also tells us then that if X star is contained within KK AB, then XK has to be equal to X star. And therefore, CG will converge to X star in most n iterations since KKAB is the subspace of Rn of dimension K. Note that the theoretical guarantee that CG will converge in n steps is of no practical use, because in floating point arithmetic, we will not get exact convergence to X star. More importantly, we assume that n is huge, so we want to terminate CG well before n iterations anyway. Nevertheless, the guarantee that you will have convergence in at most n steps is of historical interest, and Hestian and Stifel originally viewed CG as a direct method that will converge after a finite number of steps. The steps of the CG algorithm are chosen to give the orthogonality properties for the RK and the PK, which lead to the remarkable CG optimality property that CG will minimize the error over the Krylov subspace KK of AB at step K. So we might ask ourselves, where do the steps in the CG algorithm come from? And it turns out that CG can be derived by developing an optimization algorithm for the scalar function phi from Rn to R, given by phi of x is equal to half x transpose ax minus x transpose b. And if we look at our CG algorithm, then we find that lines 3 and 4 are performing a line search, and line 7 is giving a new search direction pk. As an aside, note that minus the gradient of phi is equal to b minus ax, which is just equal to r of x. And the name conjugate gradient then comes from the property that if we take the dot product of gradients at two steps xk and xj, that will just be equal to rk transpose rj, and that will be equal to zero for j less than k via our orthogonality relations. Therefore, the gradient directions are orthogonal, and we might also refer to them as conjugate. We can ask ourselves why the quadratic objective function phi is relevant to solving the linear system Ax equal b. And the answer to this is that minimizing phi is equivalent to minimizing the a norm squared of ek. Since if we look at the a norm squared of ek, that will be equal to x star minus xk transpose a x star minus xk, which we can expand as xk transpose a xk minus 2 xk transpose a x star plus x star transpose a x star. And that will be equal to xk transpose a xk minus 2 xk transpose b plus x star transpose b. And that will be equal to 2 times phi of xk plus a constant. Hence, our argument from above shows that at iteration k, CG is solving the optimization problem of finding the minimum over the Krylov subspace kk of ab of phi of x. An important topic which we won't consider in detail is the convergence analysis of CG. How fast does the A norm of EK converge. A famous result for CG is that if A has two norm condition number kappa, then the A norm of EK divided by the A norm of E0 is less than or equal to two times the square root of kappa minus one divided by the square root of kappa plus one raised to the power of K. And therefore we see that smaller condition numbers will imply faster convergence. Suppose we want to terminate CG when the A norm of EK divided by the A norm of E0 is less than or equal to epsilon, where epsilon is a small positive number. How many CG iterations will this require? To answer this, let's look at the expression involving the condition number kappa, 
we have our expression 2 square root kappa minus 1 divided by square root kappa plus 1, all raised to the kth power. And we can rearrange this to be equal to 2 times 1 minus 2 divided by the square root of kappa divided by 1 plus 1 divided by the square root of kappa, all raised to the kth power. And now let's look at the limit when kappa is large. In this case, the kappa factor in the denominator can be neglected. And we therefore see that the a naught vk divided by the a naught v0 has to be less than or equal to an expression approximate to 2 times 1 minus 2 over square root of kappa all raised to the kth power. Therefore, we can terminate Cg when 1 minus 2 over square root of kappa all raised to the kth power is approximately equal to epsilon over 2. If we take logs of both sides, then we see that k will be approximately equal to a half times the magnitude of the log of epsilon divided by 2 times the square root of kappa. And this last expression here follows from the Taylor expansion, where log of 1 minus 2 divided by the square root of kappa is approximately equal to minus 2 divided by the square root of kappa. So this analysis shows then that the number of CG iterations for a given tolerance epsilon will grow approximately as the square root of kappa. We'll now take a look at a Python example where we use the conjugate gradient method to solve the discrete Laplacian on a 2D grid and we'll look at different sizes of grids and see how that affects the condition number and the number of CG iterations that we require. We'll now look at the program PoissonCG.py that demonstrates the conjugate gradient method applied to the Poisson equation. And we're going to solve the Poisson equation on the unit square omega equal to 0, 1 squared. And the Poisson equation is minus del squared u is equal to f on omega. And we're going to make use of a constant right hand side source term where f is just equal to 1 everywhere. And we're going to use zero Dirichlet boundary conditions, so u is equal to zero on the boundary of omega. And we're going to discretize omega using a regular square n by n grid, and that will correspond to a grid spacing of h equal to 1 divided by n minus 1. And in the diagram shown here, the red grid points are on the boundary, and our solution will be a zero there and the purple grid points are in the interior and we need to solve for our solution there and it will be non-zero. If we look at the code then we first define n and here I'm going to use value 26 and we then define the corresponding grid spacing. Next we need to create the center difference differentiation matrix for the Laplacian and we're going to make use of the standard five point stencil for the Laplacian. We'll define DE to be 1 divided by h squared, which is the term that appears in the denominator of the stencil entries, and we'll then define NN to be equal to n minus 2, and that is the number of grid points across in the interior purple grid where we need to solve for our solution. We then define three vectors, CEN, HOR, and VER, that set the stencil entries corresponding to a central grid point, its horizontal neighbors, and its vertical neighbors. And the central entries will have size 4 divided by 8 squared, and the horizontal and vertical neighbor entries will have size minus 1 divided by 8 squared. We then use the SciPy sparse library to compute our differentiation matrix A here, and this will be made of a matrix with five non-zero diagonals. We'll have a central diagonal for our central stencil entries, and then four terms corresponding to the orthogonal neighbors of each grid point. We'll then define our right-hand side vector corresponding to the function f, and this will just be equal to a constant 
nn times nn vector of ones. And we'll compute the norm of this vector that we'll use to terminate the conjugate gradient algorithm later. We'll then define the tolerance for our conjugate gradient iteration that we'll use to terminate the algorithm. And we'll then define our solution vector that is initially all zeros. We'll compute our residual vector and we'll then compute our initial conjugate gradient direction P. And we'll then define a iteration counter. We'll then get into the iteration itself and we'll first compute the scalar quantity alpha and we'll use that to update the solution x and the residual r. Once we have our new residual we can compute a relative residual by evaluating the norm of r and dividing it by the initial norm of the right hand side vector and we'll print out the iteration counter and this relative residual and if that relative residual falls below our tolerance then we'll terminate the algorithm at this point. Otherwise we'll compute the scalar beta and we'll then use that to update the conjugate gradient direction. After this is completed we'll then compute the condition number of our differentiation matrix and in order to do this we first compute the dense version of our differentiation matrix and in general when we get to a large grid this will be a very expensive operation. Since our differentiation matrix is nn squared by nn squared this dense matrix will have nn to the fourth entries. Here it's feasible for the small grids that we consider to just do a direct calculation of the condition number but this calculation would not scale if we wanted to do a large grid. But here we're just using this for diagnostic purposes. The actual conjugate gradient method has no problem in running on a very large grid. So once we have computed this then we'll assemble our solution from the conjugate gradient method we'll initialize here a large grid that is n by n across and we'll then populate the interior nn by nn grid points, the purple grid points, with our solution vector. And we'll then make a 3D plot of the result. So let me now go ahead and run this program. And initially we see that we get the messages about the relative residual and we see that these drop over time and we then get a message about the grid spacing h and the condition number which works out to be 250 in this case. And our solution looks like what we would expect for the Poisson equation. We have a central peak and our solution is zero on the boundaries of the domain. So let me now change the program to run on a larger grid of where n is equal to 51. And we'll note here that we required 32 iterations for the previous grid and we'll now run this new grid. And we see that we now have a more refined calculation of our solution. And in this case, we see that the condition number has increased. We see that the number of iterations has doubled to now about 65 and the condition number has quadrupled roughly in size. So we can now look in more detail at how the iteration number and the condition number will scale as a function of n. For the discrete Laplacian, the condition number kappa scales like big O of h to the minus 2. And this result can be derived using finite element analysis that we're not going to consider here. 
And since we showed that the number of conjugate gradient iterations should scale like the square root of kappa, we know that in this case the number of iterations required should scale like big O of h to the minus 1. And in our example program, we made use of a tolerance of epsilon equal 10 to the minus 4 on the relative residual, and we obtained the following convergence results. We first looked at a small grid where n was equal to 26, that corresponds to a grid spacing of 0 0.04. Our condition number was around 250, and we required 33 CG iterations. For the larger grid, when n was equal to 51, our grid spacing was 0 0.02. Our condition number was around 1000, and we required 65 CG iterations. I also ran the example program for n equal 101 and n equal 201, and we saw growth of both kappa and the CG iterations for these cases. So we can now verify the expected scalings by plotting this data. We'll first look how the condition number scales as a function of the grid spacing, and we'll make use of a log-log pair of axes. And we can see that our grid points follow a straight line, and if we fit the slope of this straight line, then we can indeed verify that the condition number scales like h to the minus 2. If we look at the number of conjugate iterations required, again in log-log space, the points follow a straight line. If we fit these data points, then we indeed see the expected scaling of h to the minus 1. In the Python example, we saw that CG gets more expensive for the Poisson equation as the grid spacing h is reduced for two reasons. Firstly, the matrix and vectors become larger, and therefore each CG iteration is more expensive. In addition, we require more iterations since the condition number gets worse. The final crucial idea that we'll mention is preconditioning. And the idea is that we can pre-multiply our linear system A is equal B by a preconditioning matrix M to obtain the linear system MAX equal MB where the solution x will be the same as for the original system. The CG convergence rate will then depend on the properties of MA rather than A. We know that we can't transform a matrix to triangular form via a finite sequence of similarity transformations. However, it is possible to approximately do this and one idea is to choose M to be the approximate inverse of A. And in that case, MA will be approximately equal to the identity matrix. And that will have a smaller condition number than A. Good preconditioners have to be cheap to compute and they should significantly accelerate the convergence of an iterative method. And indeed, in practice, preconditioners can have a dramatic effect on convergence. For example, with preconditioning, we can ensure that the number of CG iterations required for the Poisson equation is independent of the grid spacing H. Preconditioning for Krylov subspace methods is a major topic in scientific computing, and it's really essential for large-scale problems.